Uh, of course, I'm very honored, very happy to, to participate in this 100th anniversary of ACTA Centiarum Mathematicarum, in other words, ACTA Seged, which I probably don't pronounce in, a, in the really correct way. But it's, once again, great pleasure, great honor. And uh, I'm uh, honored to uh, introduce the first speaker, Professor Mashregi from the University of Laval, who is going to give us a talk on dilation theory, an account on a one century old theory. Please, Professor Mashregi. Uh, merci, Gilles. Uh, thank you, Lajos. Do, do you see the screen? I do. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Let me see. Yeah, okay. Yes. It's a great honor to be part of this program. And um, following Lajos, my talk is mostly historical too. And I'm first try to say why dilation is important for, for mathematician. And then in second part, its application in function spaces, in particular in the first part, you will see the name already mentioned by, by Lajos. And the first three are uh, very classical, the, the last two also, but uh, they bring some open problems. And if time permits uh, in the part three, we will see a bit of generalization of the dilation idea and the challenges we are facing there. To do so, we stay on the complex plane and uh, even smaller than that on the open unit disk. It sounds a small area, but it is not. And if you look at what Don said, I mean, he has lived greater part of his mathematical life in the open unit disk. So it's, it's not a small neighborhood. There are many interesting things happening over there. Uh, I try to convince you that uh, space hole D is, is very huge. And to do, there are several ways to do it. The first one is that every Banach space has a copy, indeed infinitely many copies inside whole D. That's the title of my talk in the upcoming IVOTA. But in this talk, I've gathered about 10 evidence of the pathological boundary behaviors in when we approach T and due to those behaviors, we go and apply the dilation uh, theory. So what are these uh, pathological boundary behaviors? For the first one, we need a definition. A function which is defined by a simple summation like this, and Cn are in little l1 to assure the convergence. And we put the, the poles outside the open unit disk, converging to the boundary. We call such a thing a Borel series. So everything is well defined inside D. You can amuse with a finite number of them. You can a rational function, and the rational function can have finitely uh, many zeros inside D. And here is the surprise. In 1921, Wolf proved that there is a Borel series which is identically equal to zero inside, but not outside. And you can imagine what happens on the boundary outside when we approach T. There has to be many, many poles at every, close to every boundary points. The second evidence is by Littlewood. Consider any sequence which satisfies these two properties. The first one is to assure that this function is well defined on the open unit disk. And the second, to, to assure that it's not in H2. And then for almost all choices of the sign plus and minus one, this function fails to have radial uh, well, limits when they go to the boundary. And for many indeed, for almost all, it is interesting to, to observe that in some application, even knowing that one such sign exists is enough to conclude the remarks, but still we have many, many more options. Dan Frostman, he uh, constructed a Blaschke product. So Blaschke product, they are bounded, but this is a peculiar construction such that when we go to the boundary at all, it's not almost all, it's at all points, 
the radial limit exists and it's unimodular. And at the same time, if we remove this restriction, we go to boundary with no uh, restriction freely, then uh, lim inf is equal to zero. It means that again, zeros accumulate at all points of the boundary, but extremely non-tangentially. This result uh, was obtained by Bagemil Seidel and also by Rudin, uh, both at the same time. A continuous function on D, well, being continuous is a restriction, but uh, still uh, continuous function can have uh, oscillations, very wild oscillations. And the result says that F follows phi radially when we go to the boundary on a set E. What is the restriction on E? Just being a, a set of the first category. So on a first set of first category, analytic functions, pretty much we can say they follow continuous function. And recall that uh, such a set can be a full measure uh, on T. For the next result, I mean, consider any uh, Jordan curve inside D, which intersect T just at one point, and then rotate it by, by theta, call it gamma theta. Here is a picture. It can be any, any curve which is tangential to the point one, and then we rotate it. And the result by Lowater and Piranian says that there is a bounded function such that the limit of f does not exist for all, for all points, for any point on the boundary, but if we go to the boundary on that curve. And note that at the same time, by Fatou theorem, the radial limit exists almost everywhere. So uh, the way we go to the boundary is important. The result of McLean, it uh, has certain similarities to the uh, but here is just a holomorphic function and we go to the boundary radially, but still at all points, at all points, there is a construction such that lim inf is zero, lim sup is plus infinity. And you can imagine this function has, I mean, very oscillatory behavior at all points of the boundary. And interestingly enough, we can, we can uh, construct the function to be zero free on D, no zeros. Uh, the remaining ones are um, in, in the flavor of function spaces. Uh, usually if the derivative of a function is in a function space, the function is either in X or in something better than X. <clears throat> but Heyman constructed a function such that the derivative is in the Nevalina class, but the function itself is not. We will talk more about Nevalina class in the second part. And Ahern, uh, before this theorem, uh, Nevalina class thought to be the, the largest class that the function space theory work with, and all the operation when we do, it's closed. I mean, we stay in this space, but uh, Ahern constructed the Blaschke product such that while B is bounded, the, the derivative is not in the huge space. And finally, a uh, result of uh, Alleman, Richter, and Ross. You remember in the first example, we talked about Borel series. So they, they, they said that th there is a Borel series which is in the disk algebra, but it doesn't have pseudo continuation across any set of positive Lubeck measure on T. So there are some technical words here. I don't go into detail. Just in, this is my last example. I mean, this 10 example was just to show that when we go to boundary, either from inside or from outside, very wild behavior might happen. And to do so, we appeal to dilation. The definition is very simple. F of RZ is equal to F at the point RZ. That's a dilate of F. The good thing about F 
R is that it leaves on a bigger disk, at least our radius one over R. So at all point of T, the open unit disk, uh, FR is analytic. And when R goes to one, FR converges to F uniformly on compact subsets of D. In technical language, it's hidden in this boxed formula. When we say FR goes to F in whole D, it means precisely the, the same thing. We will see several of these box formulas in the second part. So here is our goal. Uh, we consider a Banach space of analytic functions, and we want to see uh, if f of r goes to f in the topology or in the norm of x. And sometimes that instead of f of r, we consider a function of f of r, like log plus or log of one plus t. We want to see if this combination goes to f, uh, f of f when we go to the, to the boundary. So we start with the classical Hardy space, HP. I believe everybody in the audience is familiar with the definition. We consider this integral means, which can be written in terms of dilation too. So it's an LP norm of FR. It depends on R, of course. <clears throat> the classical uh, tree circle of uh, Hadamard says that log of m infinity is a convex uh, function of log r being a non-decreasing a simple consequence of maximal principle. The, the main message is here, convexity with respect to log r. And Landau asks if it can be extended to other values of p. And Hardy did this. He showed that log of m p has the same property. And experts like Peter Duren believe that this is the first theorem in the theory of Hardy spaces. And the definition, uh, since uh, based on the observation of Hardy, this quantity is increasing, we can say either supremum or limit. If this quantity is finite, we call it the norm of F and uh, the hardiest spaces are those for which this quantity is finite. And the notation HP with superindex P and the, the attribution hardiest space was coined by our hero, Efres in 1923. That uh, also justifies the, the title of uh, my talk, a one century old uh, story. So it goes back way to a hundred years ago. And here is our first serious theorem about dilation by, by uh, uh, Ries himself. For any f in HP, fr converges to f when r goes to one. That's the first dilation theorem. Some words about the proof. Uh, it, there are many interesting things about the approach that uh, uh, Ries adopted to arrive at this. Uh, the first one is that he obtained the first version of the canonical factorization theorem. That's fund uh, a fundamental theorem in function spaces. And the version that Ries obtained was this. He extracted the zeros as a Blaschke product. So we can write f equal to b times g. And more important, the, the, norm, does, the norm of g does not increase. It's, it's equal to the norm of f. This is a very important result with many, many consequences. He himself used it to show that any function in HP has radial limit almost everywhere. He obtained this uniqueness result that if the function is not identically zero, then log of mod f is integrable. Obtained the dilation theorem that I just mentioned and also another uh, result and dilation result that uh, if f in HP log plus of fr mod fr goes to log plus of mod f in L1. Mm -hmm. To mention his broader name, he also obtained a result in the same atmosphere uh, for characterization of Blaschke product. 
uh, you showed that a function, a uh, holomorphic function is a Blaschke product if and only if log of mod fr goes to zero in L1 as we go to the boundary. Uh, I don't know why he did not publish the result, but uh, why later it was published by Otto Frostman. Back to a freeze theorem, I highlight the fact that I didn't put identity here. It works for P strictly less than infinity. Uh, of course, it doesn't work for uh, all function in H infinity because uh, these guys are continuous and if they uniformly converge to something, that something should be continuous too on the closed unit disk. And there are examples like infinite Blush group product, singular inner function, or any f, which is discontinuous on, on t, for which this doesn't work. Uh, so we, 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 we should not even talk about dilation because of discontinuity. And in such cases, uh, this is important here, either we have to sacrifice the space, I mean, consider something smaller, or sacrifice the topology, smaller topology. I will give three examples of sacrificing the space and one example of sacrificing the topology. Here, we go to a smaller space, disk algebra, H infinity, but continuous on the boundary two. And for this, it is easy to see that uh, the dilation theorem we are looking for holds it's kind of immediate from the definition of the, fun of, the of the space. And if we sacrifice the topology, this is the uh, theorem which was mentioned in the introduction by Lyers too, the famous this representation theorem. L infinity is the dual of L1, so it has a weak star topology on it. And this weak star topology can be inherited by H infinity too as a subset of L infinity. And with that, FR goes to F, but not in the norm topology, in something smaller in weak star topology of H infinity. Well, this finishes our classical uh, setting of HP. And now we go to other spaces. The first one is uh, Nevadina and Smirnov classes. Uh, as uh, parallel to the definition of MP that we saw in Hardy spaces, we consider this quantity and or write it uh, as uh, L1 norm of this log plus of the dilation. Uh, this quantity is again uh, something increasing or better to say non-decreasing function of R. So as in the case of Hardy spaces, we can uh, consider either the supremum or the limit. And if this quantity is finite, we call it a, a member of the Nevadina space. This space is huge because all Hardy spaces are there and there are more. There are more elements in, in N. Uh, it is natural based on the definition to define a norm like this, but you immediately see it doesn't work. For example, if F in mod is less than or equal to one, this is identically equal to zero. Nevertheless, this is a useful quantity. And in many application, we use this, even though it's not a norm, we use this notation. A better notation is this one. We add one here to overcome the previous difficulty. And uh, like in HP spaces, P less than one, it's not a norm, but uh, even though I repeatedly say norm, uh, norm of F minus G is a complete translation invariant matrix. Uh, interesting properties, many interesting properties and fascinating properties about this matrix. Addition is continuous, so we obtain a topological group. But surprisingly enough, the scalar multiplication is not. And this was obtained by Davis in 73. So uh, it's, I mean, uh, even myself, I didn't know about this just uh, a few months ago when I wrote the paper, I, I realized that I always thought that it's a topological vector space, but it is not. It is, N is not a topological vector space. Um, 
Why it is at, attributed to uh, Nevalina uh, FMR? It, it's because of this famous theorem, mm, just for information, any function in F is the quotient of two function in H infinity. It's an even only if it's a characterization. Uh, dilation phase in N, FR doesn't go, go to F for several reasons. It will be clarified soon. And here is one example. Uh, we will see why this for this F, FR doesn't go to F. And here is our second example in which we sacrifice the space and we go to something smaller. Let's see where the problem comes from. We saw that uh, by Nevalina uh, theorem, F can be written as the quotient of G and H. Apply the canonical factorization to G and H and simplify. There shouldn't be any zeros left in the denominator, the Blaschke product up and down, they simplify to this. Outer parts can be merged. Singular part can be simplified, but it might happen that something stays in the denominator, S2. And that's the source of all difficulties. This uh, led Smirnov to define the N plus all elements for which there is nothing, no singular part in the boundary, just B times S times O. Well, as a definition of, of N plus, this is good, but there are other characterizations like this one by coaching. Again, you see the, the effect of dilation. F is in N plus if and only if we have this convergence in L1. Log plus of mod FR goes log plus of mod F in L1. And we can also use the other quantity, log of one plus mod FR, if it goes to the corresponding quantity on the boundary in L1, we obtain a characterization of Smirnov class. This is Shapiro Shields characterization. And uh, for our main story, dilation, uh, it works in N plus. I mean, if F is in a Smirnov class, if FR goes to F, it doesn't matter here, if I write N or N plus, it's the inherited topology. And it, it, in reverse order, it also works. I mean, if something like this happens, it has to be in the Smirnov class. And the example uh, we saw before, it is easy to show that it's not in the Smirnov class. It's indeed one over a singular. Uh, this one is one over a singular in a function. So certainly not in the Smirnov class. And so this fails. And uh, that is why we switch to a smaller space. Our next uh, space is the block space. Uh, a small comment about the, the history of this. If you have a function and you normalize it such that mod of f prime at the origin is one, Blach uh, observed that there is a universal constant uh, denoted by B, such that uh, there is a subdomain in D. And if we restrict F into this subdomain, it is one-to-one -one, and its image contain a disk of radius B, I mean, known as Schlitt disk. In other words, on, on, on this uh, domain, F is reversible. But the important thing is the existence of this disk. And if we, uh, I mean, for the, for the constant uh, using uh, elementary tools, uh, like Rochet theorem, we can say that it's bigger than one over 72. More accu accurate estimations were obtained for the lower bound and upper bound by Shen and Gutierrez and also by Alfors and Gronsky, but still the precise value is an open question. Uh, if we use uh, um, uh, Mobius transformation and go from origin to another point Z0, we see that uh, for a given function uh, F, uh, there are Schlittix of radius at least equal to this quantity 
and at most equal to this, that this is something easy to prove. So we see this quantity comes into picture and Bloch uh, defined the space by the, those for which uh, this quantity is finite uh, on the it is upper bounded on the on the open unit disk and to take care of the constant we add a term here there are many other ways to define the block spaces this is a characterization to the door and shapiro and shields uh, f is in the block space if and only if it has a representation like this g is univalent on d and c is a constant but there are many more Again, this space is big. This is our third example of a huge space. Uh, if R doesn't go to F, here an explicit example, we will see why it uh, doesn't uh, satisfy the, the property we want. And uh, again, our solution is to go to a smaller space. Instead of assuming that this quantity is upper bounded, we assume that it becomes small when we go to the boundary. The limit is in fact equal to zero. We call the space B0. And for that space, there is a famous theorem of Anderson, Clooney, and Pomeranke says that the dilation works in, in B0. And moreover, if it works, the, the element has to be in B0. And it is now easy to show that this function is not in B0, so this doesn't work. Uh, I can, I mean, extend my list and brought, uh, bring you the examples of this type in Bergman spaces, Lipschitz classes, Zygmunt class. And they are indeed in the paper that Lajos mentioned. But uh, I, I switched to two other spaces uh, for which the uh, the research is still continues. Weighted Dirichlet spaces is the first one. Here is the definition of Dirichlet integral. That's the main definition. A simple application of parcel identity gives us this uh, series representation. Well, Dirichlet himself used it around 1850 to uh, solve Laplace equation. But the Dirichlet space was introduced by Berlin in his thesis in 20s, 1920s, 25 plus, but it was published a bit later in 1933. And then uh, for two to three decades after that, Berlin uh, or with uh, Carlson or with others obtained many more uh, uh, fundamental theorems about Dirichlet spaces and really they laid the foundation of a solid theory. Uh, again, uh, to take care of the constant, we add a term here, either the absolute value of f at point zero or the normal f in h2, and it's something to take care of constant. And we obtain a norm. It is very easy based on this formula to, to see that fr goes to f under this norm. That's, uh, I mean, simply a monotone convergence theorem, uh, even bounded convergence of, uh, theorem of Lubeck can be used to, they are equivalent. But when we go to the weighted Dirichlet spaces, the story is a bit different. We put a weight here and we call it DW. It's not just for, uh, the desire to, to generalize something. Uh, there is an important theorem of Berlin classifying the invariant subspaces of the shift operator on the Hardy space. The same question makes sense in other spaces. And people started to think about the shift on the Dirichlet space and wish to observe that if you want to do that, you really need to introduce weighted Dirichlet spaces. And for the harmonic weight, I mean, he initiated the studies and obtained uh, the, 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 the result. And then it was generalized mm -hmm. further by Alexandru for super harmonic weights. Uh, for these spaces, even though the relation between D of FR and DF is simple in the classical space. In the weighted Dirichlet space, this relation wasn't that easy and took almost 30 years to uh, obtain a result which 
in one sense is complete, but in another sense is not. We will see why. Well, Richter and Sandberg uh, for harmonic weights obtained this estimation with a constant four here. A bit later, Alleman extended to superharmonic weights with a weather constant. In 97, Don Saracen, again, just for harmonic weights, obtained uh, estimation like this. And this is good because this uh, constant here is less than one. We will see why being less than one, less than or even equal to one is important. So this is the ma a major breakthrough here. Then uh, with Elfalla, Kelly, Kladja, and, and Tom Ransford, uh, we proved the same thing, but for superharmonic weights. And uh, two years after, again with Tom, we improved uh, this constant to this one. If you drew the graph of these two uh, constant, you see that this one is better. But still the good thing about either this one or this one is that it's less than or equal to one. But as in the definition of the norm, we can consider the quotient of the left side over the right side and take the supremum with respect to all weights and all function in DW and call it phi r. Phi r still is not known, but based on the estimation we provided in the just few slides, it's majorized by r2 times two minus r. And if you consider the function f of z equal to z is uh, the lower bound is R2. That's the best thing we know up to now. And uh, also, we, I mean, it's not published yet. We could show that uh, this is indeed strictly less. To, so this is not the optimal uh, constant. The optimal uh, uh, or precise value of phi R is still is not known. Uh, well, but the good news, and that is why I said, in a sense, the story is over, is that phi r is less than or equal to one. And this immediately helps us to show that in all weighted or uh, Dirichlet spaces, f r goes to f. Every talk should have a proof. And here I have a one page proof, a parallelogram identity. Here, I replace the W of FR by something bigger. So it's bigger, uh, less than or equal to four times this. And then uh, if we take lim int for this part, we can apply Fatou's lemma. So we obtain <coughs> lim int of, if of this is bigger than or equal to four times the W of F. And therefore for the other part, uh, 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 lim soup is less than or equal to zero or say equal to zero. And that's not, it's a short proof, but don't forget that the real work is hidden here when we replace the W of FR by something bigger. The huge work is hidden there. The rest is just simple calculation. Our last example for which the, uh, there are some disappointing news is dobrange wolniak spaces HP. Uh, there are uh, several ways to uh, define uh, dobranch Gobniak. Indeed, there is a very nice paper of Joe Ball, who is with us uh, now in the audience. Uh, at least three ways to define is, ex is, is explained in that paper. Uh, here is one of them, which uh, pioneered by, by Saracen. We can see that the tuplets operator uh, T F of F is you do multiplication and then you project back to the space. We know that this is a bounded to do Brown and Helmholtz. And HP is just the simple of an operator. If B is in the closed unit ball, then one minus TB, TB bar is positive. We can take the square root. So it's already a complicated thing. And then the image of that, still more complicated, but that's the way we can define it. At the beginning, it's a bit difficult, but uh, well, we can proceed and there is a well-developed theory of the branch of Niak spaces now. To define the norm, you 
consider G an element in, in, in HB, you have to go back and find F such that the image of F is equal to the, our function G. And then norm of G is equal to the norm of F. Not yet, you are, because there are many representative F, but we, we choose the one which is uh, orthogonal to the kernel. And this way it is uniquely defined. And, and you see the definition of the space is difficult and the definition of the norm is, is difficult, but we try to uh, overcome this difficulty. The theory of the branch of spaces is divided into two parts, basically based on this theorem, which characterizes the extreme or non-extreme point of the closed unit ball. Uh, the first two part is by De Lviv and Rudin. Here is the historical. The first part is by De Lviv and Rudin, but they say that it's uh, obtained during a conference via consultation by Arens, Bach, Carlson, Hoffman, and Royden. And the other two parts and the, its equivalence to the first two part is done by Saracen. Uh, the, the part that we need is that in Paul, uh, uh, um, polynomials or dilations are in HB if and only if B is, is non-extreme. This is something to, to consider. All, all the uh, element of all D bar. <clears throat> so we need to consider two cases, extreme and non-extreme case. The extreme case is not interesting because in a sense, in the extreme case is not a starp shape, just in one very special case in which uh, B of Z is just a monomial, this uh, implication is true. And for all other cases, which is huge, uh, there are examples such that F in, is in HP, but FR is not in HP. And therefore it even doesn't make sense to write this box formula. So we need to completely forget about the extreme case and go to the non-extreme case. In the non-extreme case, in, since one minus mod b squared is log integrable, we can define an outer function with this property, uniquely if we assume this one too. And then for each f, there is a pair, call it f plus with this property. Here is a great contribution of Don Saracen. Remember, it was very difficult to calculate the norm of F. And he showed that the norm of F can be uh, obtained via the norm of F and F plus, but in H2. So it's better because uh, instead of going to find a pre-image and then uh, make project it onto the orthogonal complement of the kernel, we have to find F plus. And for some subclasses, it is easy to find F plus. That is why this is a useful formula. And also this formula helped us to obtain the result, even though the results are somehow disappointing. Here is a theorem. There are non-extreme symbols B and elements in, F, in the HB, such that FR doesn't converge to F. This is the first uh, dilation theorem which fails, but in a non-trivial way. In other, we have seen other examples in which dilation fail, but for, a, for kind of trivial reason, either the space was too big, like in the uh, Nevanila class or in, in the block space. I mean, they, they were not even separable. So we cannot hope that the dilation converge or even in H infinity. Here we have a space such that it's separable. Polynomials are dense and all good properties are there. And still FR doesn't converge to F. That is why detecting this property wasn't that easy. Here is a history of this in, 20, in 2010. Uh, Chevreau, uh, Guillaume, and, 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 and Ransford observed that, oh, there is something wrong. Usually FR is bounded with respect to R, for, but for this space is a small O 
of one over one minus r. Still, this if this is true, it's still uh, the norm of fr might be bounded, but yet they succeeded to construct an explicit example for which lim soup goes to infinity. So that is the first non-trivial example of a dilation which explodes. The question was, can we replace lim soup by lim? This took about six years with a collection of colleagues, you saw the names before. Uh, Elfa, Lafrik, and Kelly, uh, and Ransford, we showed that yes, with a construction slightly different, we can replace limb soup by limb. And uh, in this construction, Blaschke products pay, plays a role, a major role. Uh, we could obtain another construction for which there is no zero. It's even B is outer function. And still, this holds. Of course, if this holds dilation, uh, something like this fails to I mean. And uh, I mean, open question of uh, coming from this, since limb here, limb of the dilation goes to infinity and dilation is related to Sn and sigma n via some formulas, immediately we see that limb soup of Sn of f or sigma n of f, the Caesar mean should explode. But we don't know if there is an example for which limb goes to infinity. So this is something to think about it. And also in previous uh, function spaces, norm of FR was a kind of increasing function. It's not the case in, in HB. And we want to characterize for which spaces this is the case. Still, we do not know. Uh, I think I still I have time, Lajush or, or Jill. Do I? Uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, but, do you? Uh, Jill Pizier is uh, muted. <laughs> That's the problem. Okay, uh, I, I I suggest you you go ahead. I was told you know, to, to be actually rather lax. So yes, yeah. go, go ahead. How about even, I think I started at 10. Yes, 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 50. Yes, yes, you're actually, you do. Mm -hmm. I have to compute to answer you <laughs> rigorously. Please go ahead. Uh, it, I, I'm happy to have time to, to end with this third part, the, the summation theory. That's another way to look at the dilation. Um, consider a Taylor series expansion like this. Usually we chop, we don't go up to infinity uh, and we obtain a polynomial and we expect that this Taylor polynomial converges to F. We expect, it's not always the case. Uh, for example, we know that S N O F goes to S in HP, non-trivial result. This is a immediate consequence of Marshall Ries theorem on the boundedness of Hilbert transform on, on LP. And, but it fails if we apply it for P equal to infinity, which is this algebra, it fails. And for P equal to one, it also fails. So what is a remedy? A, a very common solution is to consider, we chop of course, but we add a weight here. And this weight is so famous. It's called Cesaro means, or Cesaro means, I denote it by sigma n. Uh, the same quantity can be written as the average of S0 up to Sn. And uh, with, uh, with this sigma n, well, there is a good and happy ending. Sigma n of f goes to f for all elements of the disk algebra. So this is a constructive polynomial approximation scheme. The same for, for, for elements of H1. And we can write the relation between Cesaro uh, means and the Taylor polynomials by this matrix uh, multiplication. The, uh, the rows are the famous uh, elements of, of, of the Cesaro summation. And in the general setting, why just one or one over two? We consider uh, an array of complex number. Of course, we need to put some conditions such that when we multiply a row here by the elements here, you obtain something convergence. 
the goal is to adjust the, the element here such that if we have a convergent uh, sequence here, sigma n also converges and converges to the same sum. So two restrictions, convergent and convergent to the same sum. For this, there is a technical word, it's called regular. If the matrix uh, has this property, we call it regular and a result of tuplets and Steinhaus, I mean, two separate papers, but at the same time, they characterize very easily the, the regular matrices. In each column, we should go to zero. All rows should be in L1 and uniformly in L1. And all rows, when we sum up, um, in many applications, this is identically equal to one, even we don't have a limit here. But if it's not equal to one at the limit, when we go down, it goes closer and closer to one. There are other classes, for example, classes that transform bounded sequences to convergent ones, or the class that uh, transform convergent sequences to convergent sequences, but not necessarily of the same limit. I mean, th th there are characterization for them too, but I stay with regular one. Uh, the connection, we already saw FR. Uh, I, I can write it here. There is R to the N times our A N Z N. And to write this in terms of S N, note that A N Z N can be written as S N of F minus the previous one. And if I plug this identity to this and simplify, I obtain this representation of F N, F R, in terms of S N of F. And here are my coefficients. So I obtain a summation uh, as in the case. The only difference is that it's not discrete. Our parameter is R, but this really doesn't matter. And uh, uh, we can say, I mean, uh, knowing this, a, a series is able summable if you if this quantity, write it in terms of the coefficient or write it in terms of the partial sums, converges to S as R goes to one. And for the Chesar summation, uh, we saw it before. I mean, the, these two are two famous methods of summation. Uh, to compare, we say that Y is stronger than X or X is included in Y if, <clears throat> Uh, something is convergent in, in include some, so, sorry, X is stronger. If something is convergent this is, this is, is with respect to Y, the, it also uh, convergent with respect to the summation method X. And I will write it this way. So uh, to, to repeat, this means that the summation method X covers all the, uh, uh, sequences covered by Y and maybe even more. Uh, for the two we saw uh, up to now, Abel and Cesaro, Cesaro is included in A and the inclusion is even uh, strict uh, by uh, an example of lambda O, he introduced this series which is able summable but not Cesaro summable. Uh, we need to generalize to go beyond dilation. And for this, we consider um, power series method. For the power series, we consider a function PR, its development, it is convergent uh, on a disk of radius R. R is, is, is not zero, I mean, it's, re it's a real disk. But the important uh, assumptions here are that the first term is not zero and the others are positive, just to avoid dividing by zero here. And we saw before that uh, we multiply by Rn, but this time we multiply by Pn Rn, the element here, and divide the whole thing by one over P, to, uh, P of R, and then let R goes to the boundary. And if the limit exists, we say that uh, our series is P summable. We have seen examples of this before. Example one, consider P of R simply one over one minus R. The development, this is a geometric series, with radius of convergence one. 
And if we apply this definition, we see that this is precisely what we saw before. It's the Abel summation method. So Abel summation method is a special case of the, the power series. We can say it differently. We can say that the dilation that I mean, it was the main part of my talk is a special case in this uh, huge series of summations. Example two, put an exponent alpha here. The coefficient is a bit more complicated. It really doesn't matter, but we adopt the same definition. Again, the formula more complicated. We have a summation method, which depends on alpha. We, we call it A exponent alpha. It's able method of o order alpha. And for alpha equal to one is the classical method we saw before. So it's a, a chain of methods from zero to infinity. And David Boring showed that uh, if alpha is less than beta, we obtain a stronger method. It's better. So uh, again, imagine you have a chain somewhere in, in the middle for alpha equal to one sits the classical dilation method. But when we go toward zero, we obtain something better and better. And naturally we say that is there something happening when we go to zero or an interpretation for alpha equal to zero. Here is our third example, one over r log of one over one minus r. The, the expansion is this. We adopt the same definition, the general definition, and the formula becomes this one. This is called the logarithmic summation method introduced by Peter, uh, by David Burwin, and we denote it by L. And uh, also Burwin showed that that's the strongest summation method, stronger than all of the Abel summation method. I didn't mention all summation methods are also stronger than all the Caesar summation methods. So this is really something strong. Sorry that I end my talk with uh, still a disappointing uh, news. This is a rather fresh result by uh, Parise, Ransford, and myself. Same uh, um, as, as, as we saw before, uh, there is an element, B, non-extreme, and uh, there is an element in, in the Dobranjovniak space HB for which this limit fails. And note that LR of F is a major generalization of the dilation method and still it fails. So we need to find something even stronger than that. And uh, that's my last open question. Still, we do not know the answer. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this historical talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.